Hello and welcome back to Highway to Hoover, a production of SEC Extra over at D1Baseball.com. I'm your host, Joe Healy, joined today by my good friend, Robbie Falk, who covers Mississippi State Baseball for Maroon and White Daily, part of the On3 Network. That's a, a change for Robbie, actually, since last time we, we talked to him. New little gig for, for our buddy here. Um, we will jump in with him in a moment to talk about some of the positives of the Mississippi State baseball season, maybe some reasons for optimism. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the negatives, right? I mean, it, it hasn't been the, the rosiest first three weeks of the season for State, but uh, so, you know, we'll talk about both ends of the spectrum with him. But first, I have to let you know that this episode of Highway to Hoover and every episode of Highway to Hoover is brought to you by Pitch Logic, the system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play from youth leagues to the big leagues. The easy-to-use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level. See PitchLogic.com for more information. Uh, first off, Robbie, I mentioned it up top, but congratulations on the on the new gig. Um, that's always exciting stuff, and, and I appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you again. It's been, been a while. I didn't see you much last year. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot for you to come cover last year, though, I don't think. I saw Mark a couple of weeks ago, so hopefully we can get you down here pretty soon. Yeah, I, mean, I, I you know... It's, it's not for a lack of interest in coming to Starkville. Believe, believe you me, um, fun atmosphere. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a sucker for kind of those smaller college towns too. So I, uh, you know, it, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there's a little more to cover down there, uh, that way this season so that, uh, I can make an excuse to, to get down there. That'd be a lot of fun for me. Um, let's actually start with something really recent last night, state beats Southern Miss and Pearl, um, five to four, um, and I think it was notable when you wrote about this. So if you're interested, go, go check out what Robbie wrote about how the bullpen really led the way. I mean, Southern scores four runs in the first and state somehow comes back and, and finds a way to win that game, which I imagine down for nothing. The first, most of the fan base thought, well, here we go again. Um, but it went a different way. Is, is that the best piece of evidence we've had so far that new pitching coach, Justin Parker combined with maybe some new faces has, at least created some positive momentum on the mound? I think we've seen a little bit of it early, but a lot of it is, you know, the wonder of, is this just the competition they're playing? I think there's something to be said about the fact that they're not walking hardly anyone at this point. And last year, that wasn't the case. In this very game last year, I think they walked 11 guys. They won that ball game 10 to 9, but they walked 11 guys. They walked, they walked one guy last night. And that came in the first inning. The entire bullpen did not walk a batter, I don't believe. Or maybe they walked one. I can't remember. Uh, but it wasn't many. And that, to me, has been the biggest, the biggest sign of improvement for this team is they are attacking the strike zone and they are making hitters beat them. And that was something that really just infuriated people last year is that you just didn't give yourself a chance. And the defense behind them wasn't great last season. But you would at least want to see the defense get an opportunity to make those plays. This pitching staff is giving the defense opportunities to make plays, and they're making them. And they've upgraded at shortstop. They've upgraded at third base with Dylan Cup, the freshman, and Logan Kohler from Memphis. Both of those guys have really helped. It allows you – I mean, you know this. When you, when you know you have good defense behind you, you attack hitters differently. You, you feel like you can – attack the strike zone and you can challenge hitters a little bit more when you feel like you have guys behind you that can make those plays. And um, it's just been a, a welcome sign from this team to see this. I, I haven't looked at the numbers today, but I think they've only walked 36 or 37 guys in the first uh, whatever game, 13 games or whatever it was. Last year they had walked, I think, over 80. So that is a tremendous, tremendous improvement that we're seeing from Justin Parker. And when they get an SEC play, you know this, it's, those numbers are going to go up. We, we know that's going to happen. But I think that it's already notable that this team has made a major jump on the mound. And we've seen it in, with, with the evidence of these pitchers, the, the individual pitchers that they're putting out on the mound. Tyler Davis and Tyson Harden, both of those guys last year really struggled at times. Last night they came in in big moments and did a really good job in a couple of innings each of uh, getting out of getting through the lineup, getting out of innings, and making sure that they kept the score where it was. I, I think Justin Parker is doing a tremendous job at this point with a pitching staff that was just 
uh, dismal the last two seasons. Yeah, part of that too has been the weekend rotation. Outside of Cal Stevens' start against Georgia Southern where they got to him a little bit, I mean, it's been basically nine weekend starts and eight of them have been really good between Dome and, and Steven and Sanja. Uh, what have you seen from, from that trio? And, and how much confidence do you have that what we're seeing is not just a competition-based mirage? I'm back in here. Cal yeah, Steve struck out 11 in his first start at Mississippi State. Um, I don't think he walked anybody. He gave up a run, I think, on a home run. He was excellent. And that next week against Georgia Southern, he just couldn't put away hitters. But it wasn't a situation where he was putting guys on base. He he wasn't he wasn't commanding the strike zone. He was kind of falling apart. They just hit him. I mean, he, he was in 0-2, 1-2 counts and was just not throwing a put-away pitch. I think he really returned to form a little bit last week. And, again, these aren't great teams that he's playing, but he's a guy that's going to get ahead of counts. He's going to challenge hitters. Same thing with Nate Dome, but those guys compete. And that's what people want to see more than anything is they want to see these guys go out there and compete, and that's what they're doing. And uh, Gerangelo has been excellent in his three starts. Probably his best start of his career came last week. And that's been huge for Mississippi State to have three weekend starters that have come out and outside of that one game from Steven have lasted, you know, fairly deep in ball games, have not walked batters, have not put guys on base, are not making huge mistakes. That's been a, a really nice sign for Mississippi State. They're going to have to continue to have those really good starts. I think this this pitching staff is fairly deep from an arm perspective. So, you know, it's you can have a, a tough day on the mound as, a, as far as a starter is concerned and still kind of uh, survive the weekend when that wasn't really the case last year. But it's really nice to know that you have three starters right now that are playing really well, and they need that to continue going into the SEC schedule coming up uh, starting next week. Is there actually more reason for concern about the lineup? At this point, I mean, Dakota Jordan has has picked up where he left off last year. You feel great about him, but a little bit of a slow start for Hunter Hines. And, and the guys who are contributing are the guys that contributed last year. It just feels like maybe there hasn't been a group of guys step up to kind of fill in the holes from the guys who departed after after last year. What, what do you make of the lineup, and, and should we be a little more concerned about that versus where the pitching's at right now? Yeah, I am. I, you know, I haven't seen a whole lot from this lineup to – really give you a lot of confidence going into SEC play with the arms they're going to face. Now, we've, we've seen this before from Jake Gotro's crew. We've seen them get off to slow starts, really struggle against pitchers with sink and uh, soft tossing left-handers, guys like that. They've, they've kind of struggled with those guys in the past. And there's been a lot of seasons where when you get some power arms coming in and SEC play – guys from the right side throwing mid-90s to high-90s fastballs, and, and they start challenging state's hitters with fastballs. State does a really good job, and they start to kind of come alive. That's kind of the hope. But, the, you know, the bottom of the lineup has not been very good. Hunter Hines, like you said, has struggled a little bit, hasn't been able to really find his power at this point. But I'm not really concerned about him uh, so much as just the offense as a whole. I think Dakota Jordan, like you said, is starting to come around. He's got five home runs, hit an absolute um, tank last night. To go opposite field the way that he did uh, in that ballpark at Trustmark Park to right field uh, and hit that one out of the park was really impressive. And he's hit, a, he's hit several mammoth home runs this year, just some, some tremendous raw power. And I think as the year goes on, you're going to see him get better and better. He did that last year too, really slow start actually was out of the starting lineup, came in and was probably State's second-best hitter in SEC play. He was outstanding. So Dakota's, I think, is going to be fine. David Mershon has been a real shot in the arm for Mississippi State to get him back in the lineup after missing the first few ball games. A guy that is just – he's just not going to be denied out there. He's batting nearly 500 at this point. He can bunt uh, for singles. He can get you a, a double. I mean, he's just uh, – he's he's a gamer. So, I think he's good. I think Amani Larry is really good at the top of the order. You have three guys that you're really excited about in that lineup, and Larry, Mershon, and Dakota Jordan. But you've got to have more protection for those guys in the middle 
and the bottom of the order is going to have to get going as well. So it is a concern right now, but I think there are some good hitters in this lineup, and Jake Gotro has figured it out on a lot of teams over the years. So I, I think they will get going eventually, but you just hope it's not too late when they do start to really kind of get the, the ball rolling a little bit. We, we, we mentioned Hines and his overall numbers aren't terrible, right? I mean, he's, he's hit for some average, but it's, it's the power stroke that's been missing so far. I'm sure it's something you guys on the local beat have, have talked about with, with the team in, in media availabilities and whatnot. Is there something that has been pointed to there? Is it pressing? Is it something different? Is it something mechanical? What kind of information have you gotten on, on where he's at with his swing? You know, we haven't really been able to talk to him yet or, or talk much about him. Um, and like you said, I mean, the, the numbers aren't terrible right now as far as his batting average or anything, but he just hasn't been able to hit the ball over the fence yet. And a lot of his a lot of his stuff is, you know, he's we're seeing a lot of ground balls from him right now. And maybe that's him trying to evolve his game a little bit. I'm not sure. But uh, I'm not worried about the power that he has. I, if anything, it's kind of refreshing to see him put the ball on the ground a little bit and maybe go more ground ball or, or line drive, but he's just not been able to find any holes at this point. I think that he's going to get it together at some point. It's going to come together for him and he's going to start getting into that groove. And when he does, there's not many players in this league that have the raw power that he does from the left side. And that's going to be something that Mississippi state has to have. And whether it's moving him down the lineup a little bit to try to, get him out of a little bit of a funk and um, keep him from pressing or what, I don't know. But, you know, I, I think that he's going to hit at some point. I will say I've been impressed with him so far, what he's done at first base. He's really evolving there at first base. He's become a better defender. Um, scooped a play out of the dirt on the final play of the game against Southern Miss. It was an excellent play from both he and Dylan Cup. He's becoming a better first baseman, and he's trying to become a better hitter too. So, Maybe that has something to do with it. He, he's trying not to think – he's trying to think differently at the plate than just sending it over the right field fence. But I, I think we are seeing him kind of fight it a little bit right now. I'm interested to see how he does when he starts to see more SEC pitching because that's been where he has really been able to thrive the last two years. Yeah, it's a good call. I mean, and sometimes those are the type of adjustments when you're trying to approach things differently at the plate take more time than they would like and we would like, right? So uh, it seems like a a bad bet to make that this is going to be something that continues. I, it certainly seems like you know, that's a guy I'm willing to bet on figuring it out as, as the season goes on, even against better pitching. Um, wanted to ask you about the catching situation. Obviously, Heifel's injury has kind of put them behind the eight ball a little bit, but you, you've seen Johnny Long some. You've mostly seen Joe Powell. Uh Tell me just about the catching situation in general and what you foresee that being as the season goes on. Yeah, right now it's just kind of, uh, you know, the feel thing, I think, for him. We've seen some really good receiving from both Johnny Long and Joe Powell. And the, the Joe Powell story to me is so interesting. This is a guy that was basically giving up baseball. He was going to be, uh, I think, a paramedic or a firefighter. He was out. He was out of baseball last year, and there was a connection with Justin Parker there. And they were Mississippi State was looking for another catcher because Ross Highfield is injured right now. He's not able to catch. I think it's a little shoulder problem, and it, it's really kind of disrupted what he's wanted to do at the plate too. So they needed another veteran catcher back there, and they found uh, Joe Powell. He decided to give it another run, and it's really paying off for him. And I think it's a, it's just a really cool story to see him get this opportunity, but he and Johnny long have been a godsend for Mississippi state to get these veteran receivers back there. The Bulldogs really struggled trying to find a replacement for Logan Tanner the last two years. They just have not been able to find that guy. And, uh, you know, Ross Highfield was forced into being a catcher as a true freshman, which you know is very difficult to do in this league you're seeing pitches and velocity that you haven't seen consistently every single pitch at this point. And that's that's a difficult thing to transition to. Ross Highfield is going to be a really good catcher, but doing that as a true freshman, he was going to take his, his lumps. So the last two years ha have been a little bit of a struggle for Mississippi State to find a guy 
like a Logan Tanner. And I'm not saying either one of these guys are Logan Tanner, but they've been really good back there. They're, you know, Johnny Long's a, is great at framing pitches. He's great at, at defending the plate. And Joe Powell the same way. And both those guys have been pretty good at eliminating base base runners too. So that's just been huge for Mississippi State. And I think you can give them a lot of credit for the pitching staff taking this jump too. Being able to have that veteran presence behind the plate really makes a difference for, for pitchers. And they have great relationships with both of these guys. I think that uh, they did an excellent job on uh, Tuesday night in that game. Both of them caught. Uh, Johnny Long came in the last couple innings, had a really good past couple innings to, to end that thing. And I think both of them are going to be huge for Mississippi State and SEC play, especially if they are, are hitting the way that they can, they can hit as well. Yeah, you mentioned the impact that has on the pitching staff. Totally agree. And, and even something as small as, you know, last year pass balls were a real problem. And to not have that be as much of a concern it is gives gives a pitcher a lot of confidence that hey I can throw my nastiest stuff here and the ball's probably not going to get to the backstop. So that that those little things kind of add up I think over over time to make the pitching staff just more confident in general. Let's um look at it, the sch- schedule a little bit because uh who boy the start to SEC play is uh there's no such thing as an easy path in SEC play. Let's be honest. However. This one's particularly tough. So after a series this weekend with Evansville, which is not nothing, that's a pretty good Valley team that like state's going to have to play well to win games there. But looking ahead to the SEC schedule, they start off with LSU at home. Then they get A&M and Florida on the road back to back the first three weekends. Um, you know, at, at the risk of being results oriented instead of process oriented, like is three and six acceptable is even two and seven acceptable. I mean, that's just such a murderer's row. I mean, that's like basically three at this point, three top five teams in terms of the way they're playing right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what, I mean, (laughs) what would be an acceptable record through that gauntlet? Do you feel like that would, that would keep people from, you know, pulling their hair out because they think, Oh gosh, this is, this is third season in a row of, of nine wins or whatever. Yeah. You know, I think three wins would be great. When you look at that, I mean, it's it's going to be tough. Your state's not hitting the ball very well. You're going to be facing some really good pitchers during that stretch. Maybe not every game, but most every game. All three of those teams can really pitch it. And they're hitting the ball well, too. It's not going to be easy. But if you can find a way to steal a game in every series, I think that's a win for Mississippi State. The The rest of the schedule is, is tough. But it's not as tough as what you're about to see for three straight weeks. Um, you know, you, you do have some manageable series in there, but it's Joe, it's going to be so tough for this team to make postseason. And that that's kind of the conundrum for Mississippi State and Chris Lamonis is you can be improved this year, but it might not show it on the record. And that's that's the issue that they're that they're faced with at this point is they just don't have the uh, to me I don't know if they have the guns to win 14 15 games in SEC play against what they're going up against and um, you know and that falls on Chris Lamonis they 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 weren't able to go out there and get a Braden Montgomery or a Luke Holman who they're about to see two straight weeks Uh, and that's kind of the that's kind of what's hurting them right now they're missing that stud outfielder and Braden Montgomery the, they could use Luke Holman for sure. I, I think their the starting rotation is good, but you know Luke Holman in this rotation would would really set it off. And that's those kind of pieces are the difference between you know a losing record in SEC play and possibly you know a two seed or fighting for postseason uh, hosting rights. And that's that's kind of what you're looking at. But I've seen some some Mississippi State teams that have been counted out go to Omaha, and I'm not. I'm not going to count this team out until it's, it's, you know, apparent that they're to be counted out, but it's going to be tough. This is going to be a really difficult road. And these first three week weekends are really going to be difficult, but you have to literally take it game by game, try to find a, try to steal a win here, a win there and see what happens. I think three and six would be marvelous for them, but it's going to be tough. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's such a good point. I mean, and the margins in the SEC are so narrow, right? I mean, thirteen wins put you on the bubble. Fifteen means you're 
you're hosting if you win a game or two in Hoover. Uh, and then nine means you're in last place again. So like the, yep. the difference of six wins is the difference between like we're playing baseball at home in June and let's face it, uh oh, we're having a big picture discussion about Chris Limonis and his staff in June. I mean, those are those are the the, the difference of six wins there, which is just it's life in the SEC. I don't have to tell you or anybody else that. So given and what's, that, what's frustrating is if yep. they, if State had this pitching the pitching they're having this year, last year, they could be hosting last year. They they won nine SEC games, and I think if they if they just eliminated the walks like they have so far this year, they did that last year, I think that this team is is fighting for a host spot. That's how that's how big that margin is, but also small. Like I, yeah, they they had a seven run earn run average. If they were to cut that down to five, who knows? Yeah, that's like the difference of five or six wins. That's that's what's crazy about the whole thing. That's what the pitching staff has done to Mississippi State the last two years. And they've seemingly fixed it, or at least greatly improved on it. Uh, but now you got the one of the toughest schedules I've ever seen for Mississippi State baseball. And, you know, we'll see what they're able to do with that. Yeah, it's yeah, such a such an interesting, interesting deal there. And that brings me to my my last question for you, which is what constitutes success for this team this year? Which I, I know is a complicated question. Um, because I think there's probably a different answer for the fans, a different answer for the coaching staff, a different answer for the for the administration. If you ask those three individual groups and, you know, you mentioned seeing Mark a little while back in the season and, and he wrote after the after that game that he covered that it like inside Duty Noble, it felt like a group of people who were dealing with PTSD together, that it felt anxious. And like when good things would happen, they'd get excited. But the rest of the time, it was just kind of like on edge. Um, so obviously, and we know why that is like, you know, the last two years haven't gone great. So in light of all of that, how would you define success this year for the team? I think making postseason play is successful because what I've, what I've tried to tell people is you're not, I don't think you're going to be able to jump from back to back nine win SEC seasons to, Super regionals, College World Series capable teams. It, it's just not that easy. It, the, what, what's happened to Mississippi State is something that's going to take a little bit to get going again. So if you're showing a um, slight, not even slight improvement, but um, relative improvement here this season, and you're getting in, you're getting into postseason play, I think if you're showing signs of life and you're showing that move back up, then I think Chris Lamonis is safe and I think it's a successful season. I, I just – the expectations here are very high, and there are a lot of people here that won't accept just simply making postseason play. But I think Zach Selman will. I think showing this improvement, showing that you're moving in the right direction, this is a guy that won a national championship two years ago, um, three years ago at this point. And – he's shown that he can win big at Mississippi state. He's, he's afforded a little more time if he's able to show that he's fixing the situation, but getting there is, is what's going to be difficult. Yeah. I think that, that's well put. I mean, it's, you, you, you have to show the progress and sometimes what constitutes progress for the people in charge is different than what some of the, the fans would think. And that's, that's what makes, makes it complicated because ultimately state is one of those jobs, as you mentioned with the, the expectations being what the, where the coach is as much hired and fired as he is elected, right? Because there's there's so much interest, you know, from all these stakeholders, and and so it's yeah, it's 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 a it's a job that I don't envy. If this goes sideways and not obviously sideways, right? If the team's about 500 in SEC play, but they're on the wrong side of the bubble, like I don't envy Zach Selman being in the room having to like really assess like how do you how do you value that progress? So. But obviously, we will wait to wait until the end of the season to discuss that in a little more depth and see how things actually play out as we discussed today with with Robbie. Some reasons for optimism. And I, I'm fascinated to kind of see how they're able to build on this. I think this weekend series against Evansville will be a good stepping stone into SEC play because, like I said, Evansville is an old team. Evansville is pretty talented. Um, you know, I did their fall report, so I, I know pretty well that, that the like 
they're a team that could come in and ruin your day if you don't play well. So that'll be interesting to see if they handle business this weekend against the Aces. You have to continue to feel good about the trajectory, at least. So there is that. Uh, Robbie, before we get you out of here, uh, go ahead and, and plug your stuff. Tell tell folks where they can find you and read your stuff. Yeah, you can check me out at Maroon and White Daily. Uh, it's on the On3 network, uh, really growing over there. That's a relatively new network started by Shannon Terry that that started 247 Sports, and he's done an excellent job. I'm happy to be back with him. So uh, if you're a state fan or just interested in Mississippi State sports, come check us out. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Robbie Falk on three. And also we have a, a daily podcast during the week called Thunder and Lightning, myself and Brian Haydad. Uh, you can find that podcast uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We discuss Mississippi State, uh, other sports, music, wrestling, whatever you guys want to talk about. We got a, we have an entire day devoted to talking about whatever is called the rumblings. You can send in questions. Joe, you can get involved at some point if you want to. Um, uh, we, we do that on uh, Tuesdays. So if you guys want to check that out, uh, send, us, send us your questions, and we'll talk about whatever you want to. Yeah, send Robbie and, and Haydad your unhinged questions for them to to throw about on the podcast. They do a fabulous job. Thunder and Lightning podcast is a fun listen. I'm a listener as well. Um, you know, Robbie's one of the. I'm gonna embarrass him while he's still sitting here looking at me, but, but one of the best folks out there in the SEC covering covering his team in college baseball. So he's a, he's a fabulous read. Obviously, if you're a state fan, you already know that. But even if you're a a fan in enemy territory, like if, if you want to read up on Mississippi State and, and a fascinating soap opera that will happen over the, the course of the entire season, Robbie's your guy for that. I would highly recommend it. Robbie, thank you for joining us today. That is going to do it for this edition of Highway to Hoover, a production of SEC Extra over at D1Baseball.com. Thank you to Pitch Logic sponsoring this and every episode of Highway to Hoover. Thank you to Robbie again for joining me. 